Producer dude, would you have ever thought that some of the most popular stuff was talking about the fisheries biology stuff? It's science. I know it's people's heads explode, but there is a whole segment of people, myself included, uh, that enjoy this stuff. It's not Scientology. That's a different thing. No, it's not Scientology. We, we're going to have Tom Cruise on. We're not going to have Tom Cruise on. That movie was really good, but he's batshit crazy. But what we do have is Chris Vandergood again. And I'll tell you what, people not only loved that, I loved it. So we were going to put him on regardless if nobody listened to it, because the info that was on that first podcast was insane. Matter of fact, I would say so much so that if people haven't listened to that for whatever reason, they'd listen to that one before they listen to this one. But it was, I mean, was that kind of eye-opening for even a guy that doesn't fish? Like what what information they were able to provide? Yeah, crazy. just the, the whole way it works with the acoustic t- telemetry. What is it? Telemetry? <laughs> Acoustic telemetry. <laughs> telemetry. I, I, yeah, I had to do that. I like telemetry, telemetry, <laughs> right. telemetry, so telemetry. The, yeah. I mean, just the way they put these uh, uh, sensors and fish and they go by and they ping these uh, with sound. And as they go by. Um, and then obviously the info that yep. you learn that you would never have thought. Like, that's the thing is the, some of the stuff you're going to hear is that it's info that you never would have thought that you could, if you could learn from fish and how that helps us with the fisheries end of it, of course, why they're doing it, but also the fishing end of it. Yeah. I mean, Chris and, you know, we've had Travis on, it's just, it's just cool information to, to find out. Um, and, and yes, it can help you with fishing, but just the science behind it and everything going on is just super interesting. Let's patch Chris in and do this. Chris Vandergoot, welcome back to the Big Water Podcast. I am not going to lie to you. You are pretty much as popular as a hot girl on a boat show. <laughs> you know, uh, do you know that? Seriously? Uh, we were at, yeah, we, me and producer dude, we were at a boat show doing some stuff, and we brought you up many times, and people knew you. People mentioned him, yeah. I do. From the podcast. Yeah. Bringing him, uh, seeing the podcast or hearing the podcast. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, big star. Producer, did you remember going back like three years ago when we started this podcast or something like that? I was like, yeah, maybe we have Travis Hartman on, you know, but those things are so boring. I see the I see the seminars they do like nobody wants to listen to that. Those pie charts. Yeah, yeah, we'll put him on just because he's a good guy. People, people, they received it well. So then we're like, boom, we, we shipped over to Chris and then it's like rock star. Here we are again. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, it's been my observation over the last 20 years of doing this on Lake Erie that their uh, anglers are becoming like more and more literate with respect to science and trying to understand the science, not just going out and catching a limit of fish. So, I mean, that's a great thing, right? Because that helps, it helps them understand why certain regulations are met, are, are made. So, yeah, well, that's great to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear people are talking about the research and that they know about it because that is one of the most difficult things for us to measure. It's easy to measure how many times the paper was downloaded or cited and things like that. It's not as easy to uh, measure, you know, if what we're doing is getting out into the fishing community because ultimately a lot of this research is funded by fish and fish dollars, right? Excise tax dollars and, and so on and so forth. So great, great to see, great to see. Well, thanks for letting me know. I was actually up in Niagara Falls at a uh, commercial fishermen's association meeting, giving an update on some of our telemetry research. So, very cool. Yeah, I think we're going to look at this podcast as kind of a 2.0 from the first one. So, if people didn't uh, watch that, there was some great information. I, and I think the thing that me and producer do were talking about is, is like when you look at the stuff. I mean, no disrespect to anybody. And I think we kind of talked about this in the first one at one point. Is you know, when I started doing the fishing thing full time, they were still basically, you know, they weren't where they're at now with figuring out what population numbers are. And, you know, they were using helicopters to time these schools to try to figure out, you know, now we're moving into trawls and things. And I personally believe in another 10 years, we're going to look at the trolls just like we probably are looking at the timing of the, you know, the helicopters, you know, trying to measure the schools out is the same thing. But what you're doing with the acoustic telemetry is more I mean, those are some hard numbers. Like the only thing that's going to keep getting better and better is we have more samples and more fish out there and and different age brackets. Like that's the big thing I really, you know, I I want to hear as we move forward is like, okay, these 18 inch fish versus 25 inch fish, or maybe some 30 inch fish. 
Yeah, so I probably should have done this. So I, I did sit down and listen to the podcast we recorded, what was it, a year ago or so this morning. And I did notice that there's a correction I'm going to have to make. So at some point, oh. if you want to circle back to that, we can we could, we could certainly do that. But yeah, to get to your point, the technology is changing, right? So I talked about how we use like these AUVs now to almost download data where you could send out a, a remote a vehicle to go download a receiver so like nobody even needs to take their boat out on the lake to get the data and perhaps even one step uh beyond that is that we're kind of experimenting with the use of real-time receivers so like these things are wired to the cloud and to the internet so that like as a fish passes a receiver we'll theoretically know exactly when that is now the problem with that is those are like really expensive receivers and there's a lot more logistics to have to work with you know but like the, the 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 technology just keeps increasing more and more from you know how long a, a receiver battery will last to even how small of a transmitter we can put in fish right so i don't know if many of you are familiar with the cisco they're like the uh the forage for like a lot of the upper great lakes very similar to the size of an emerald shiner you know when they're juvenile we're putting tags in like basically the size of emerald shiners and small gizzard shad and watching them as they're released. So like kind of, it's amazing the technological advances that well, are. You know, it's funny you say it because I thought about that too, because all of my questions, like, you know, there was so much good information in the first one that if they haven't listened to that, I'd almost recommend doing that now before you listen to what we're going to do here. But since you got a little fresher uh, memory bank on that, I mean, did we talk about some? Because I don't remember talking about the Cisco's and, and I know we had small stuff, but we, do we have in, any information from that, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. So, I mean, um, we don't. Yes and no. So, like, so they again, uh, not necessarily in Lake Erie, not releasing, you know, juvenile Cisco to uh, to, uh, you know, reintroduce those species. But like in Saginaw Bay, they're, they're starting to stock Cisco, which, again, are, are a forage based fish. They're in the white fish family. Uh, cool, cold water fish. But they're releasing them in Saginaw Bay in hopes that they can rejuvenate that population because like Cisco's everything eats Cisco throughout their life history from yellow perch to smallmouth bass to walleye to lake trout to everything because they're at the bottom of the food chain. And so, see, that's that's interesting because somebody maybe from North Dakota or something that isn't familiar with Saginaw Bay. I mean, that's kind of a joke with my Michigan buddies up there or the team up north, as we like to say, that uh, on Saginaw Bay, I mean, at times you could catch a 27, 20 inch walleye that, I mean, it weighs like four pounds. I mean, it looks like a tube sock with this giant head. And, you know, they had forage issues so much so that the salmon basically went through the straits, went over to Lake Michigan. And essentially there's just lake trout. Uh, and walleyes and smallmouth left in Lake Huron. Is that still fairly accurate? Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely some challenges with, resp with respect to the forage base, right? Like for many years, the forage base in the upper lakes, like Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Ontario, were alewives and rainbow smelt. Well, we've seen some pretty dramatic declines in the alewives, and some of the rainbow smelt populations bounce back and forth. Those, of course, are, you know, exotic or um, species that aren't native to the Great Lakes. Cisco, however are native and they were the forage base for all the great lakes lake erie the catches like google lake herring catches on lake erie and you will see like these massive gillnet tugs like literally filled to the gunnels with lake herring and so like that was the predominant forage species in lake erie as well as all the other great lakes the interesting thing about the other great lakes is they had different forms so they would have some forms of uh of cisco that were deep like probably never came up near the surface and others that were shallow water. So literally Cisco occupied every strata of the water column in Lake Erie. It was more the shallow water forms, but yeah, they're really, so is that, is that two subspecies then? Well, that there, there you go. The lumpers and the splitters, right? So yeah, I mean, so bloaters, <laughs> so bloaters, I don't know if you've ever heard of bloaters like in Lake Ontario or a lake. We uh, watched uh, producer yeah. bloat one time. Yeah. Boat. I don't I think that's a different well, deal though, right? Well, the reality is, is the way they get their name is that when they would be brought up from depth where they would be captured, their swim bladder would just like explode and they would oh. bloat. And so, and then you had these other forms or these other subspecies or species that were more shallow shallow water regardless um they were the forage base for all great lake species uh fish species you know before europeans settled before they were overfished before all the you know negative nasty stuff that happened in the great lakes 
Interesting. So that, I mean, is that something that potentially could be done on Lake Erie too? Because, you know, as we talked with like Travis Hartman on a couple of the podcasts and those populations at a hundred million or more or what have you, another couple of good hatches, everyone says like, you know, me included, like, how are we going to feed? Like yeah. <laughs> we, we had, we had three kids. Now we have 300. Like, how are we going to feed them on the same budget? So. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, so I, I'm not a manager. I don't make those decisions. You know, the, the, the likes of Travis Hartman and the other uh, lake managers in Ontario, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York, they're the ones who are, you know, make those decisions, you know, but, you know, it, it, it goes back to ecosystem stability, right? Your, your most stable environment is one that is comprised of native species, because that's the way the system had operated for thousands and thousands of years, right? So I think, you know, that's certainly something that's on the table. If you take a look at Lake Superior, which is probably the, if you would, the, the poster child for the least impact of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior has a very uh, rich and diverse forage base with all these different forage species. Cisco's and the deep water forms of Cisco's occupy the whole lake. And so from the near shore to the way offshore in the abyss. So, so is it easier, do you think, for some of those forage bases? Because like, so maybe somebody does understand, and I'm I'm in layman's terms with this compared to you, of course, but like the rainbow smelt and things like that. A lot of people that maybe fish down west of the islands never see them because they're here for such yeah. a short amount of time as they, you know, migrate back because of water temperature, gizzard shad, the same thing. So like Lake Superior, which stays much, much, much colder, you know, um, and much more percentage of that body of water they're going to have really a whole different forage base no matter what. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the thing about that's always been unique about Lake Erie and something we're starting to just, you know, the, the managers are really appreciating and putting into their management schemes is this, the, the difference between Western and Eastern basin stocks. So even when it came to Cisco, there were Cisco or Lake Herring that were spawning in the Western basin, Detroit river, along the Michigan shoreline, Ohio reefs, Ontario reefs. But there were also these stocks that are spawning down by Van Buren Bay, uh, all the way down there in the far Eastern basin. And so you'd have these, these stocks just migrating back and forth and likely the predators were always and their migrations were timed with those as well. Right. Very similar to, you know, like the dynamics you might see between wolves and and um, caribou and things like that. Like they're following their prey. And that's likely what how these systems, you know, were set up and how they they still function in some degree today. Yeah, I was speaking at a club not that long ago with people that primarily had not fished Lake Erie, you know, and mm -hmm. away from here. And you're trying to explain to them, and I kind of said it, maybe this is not accurate, but you're the guy to correct us. I said, basically, Lake Erie is like three different systems, if not mm -hmm. more, because the western, the central, and the eastern basin are really like what would be three completely different lakes or even like three different lakes on the Great Lakes. And And my question for you would be, you know, obviously you're in agreement that that's kind of the case. And then the tributaries could even be another thing. But nevertheless, does that help or hurt us when it comes to, you know, this this fishery as far as the bait and then also the species? So I'm going to go. I am not an economist. I'm, you know, I guess as a director, I shouldn't say I'm not really good as mo with money because I have to oversee, you know, funds. But you go back to your uh, uh, a, a diverse portfolio, right? Through through hard economic times. What does your financial advisor tell you? You want a diverse portfolio. You want some slow growth stuff, stuff some fast growth stuff. Same thing when it comes to fishery, fish populations. You want a diverse portfolio. So that's why I think in some respects, Lake Erie is, you know, the most immune to some of these rapid changes is because you have this diversity of stocks. You have the Ohio reefs, the Ontario reefs, the Detroit River, the Maumee River, the Sandusky River. Uh, you have some central basin tributaries, you have eastern basin tributaries, and you also have some open water reef spawning aggregations in the central and eastern basin. So the reality of it is, is I think the diversity helps us and it helps stabilize these fisheries because you've got all these little inputs coming in. So even if it's a small stock contributing, it may contribute disproportionately in one year relative to another year. Case in point, the Sandusky River. Those fish seem to make a beeline down to the eastern end of Lake Erie. I was talking to a fisherman. He goes, yep, pretty much we, can we, we know that around July 4th, we start getting large walleye from the western basin of Lake Erie. So those are the, a lot of times the Sandusky River because we, we see on our tag returns and the telemetry river, the, the telemetry data. What, so, what port was that? 
Uh, so down by Port Dover, like down in Canada, like in the heart yeah. of the Eastern Basin, right? So, so right there, that stock, the small Sandusky River, which is probably a pittance if you were to measure it against the Maumee River or even the Ohio reefs, is very important to those fishermen, at least on a seasonal basis. Interesting. Yeah, it's a, like you said, the, the thing that makes it complicated makes it good because there's yeah. just more than one thing going on. And, and so then to, to just to draw an example to the, all the other Great Lakes, right? So you have the same thing likely going on in Saginaw Bay. You got the Titabawassee River, you got the, the, the Flint, the Cash, the Shiawassee. And then you have open reef spawners. In, 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 uh, we're trying to identify if there are any open reef spawners in Saginaw Bay. Go over to Green Bay, same exact thing. You got a multitude of stocks and tributaries contributing, and that is what allows the fishery and the population to persist through, albeit tough times. Well, we, uh, we me and producer, dude, we were talking, and we gave you something we don't give people. Uh -oh. a, uh, yeah, an open free leash, if you will, <laughs> an open bag. You know, last time we talked a lot about Lake Erie stuff, obviously, we kind of dipped around some other things. Can you give us a little oversight of maybe what, what you prepped for us here for today? Right. So I was talking to some of the, the researchers working with the U USGS, that's the United States Geological Survey Cooperative Fisheries Unit that operates out of uh, Stevens Point University there at the University of Wisconsin. Um, so over, you know, kind of towards the western end of uh, the Great Lakes Basin. So uh, Dr. Dan Eiserman and uh, Dr. Damkin Demkowski and a few of the other colleagues there um, have been doing telemetry work in Green Bay on walleye for quite a few years. And that's kind of unique because they kind of took they, they kind of took a similar approach that we did in Lake Erie, where they started tagging multiple stocks or multiple, multiple aggregations of walleye. So if you fish uh, Green Bay, you know, there's the Little Bay Dinox, the, 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 the Dinox up north where there's a, a popular fishery. And then there's all the tributaries down along the south. And I know I'm going to screw it up, but like the Fox, the Acanto, the Menominee, some of those tributaries down around the, the, the southern end. And they just tagged fish in all of these tributaries, right? And they wanted to see where they were going. And then they also tagged fish when they were in what we call the mixed fishery, which is something we should talk about maybe in a bit, because this is kind of a new way of getting an idea of like, okay, which stocks are the most important. But anyway, they, they tag these fish and it's amazing. They behave very similar to walleye in Lake Erie in that they all kind of had these kind of predictable and, and repeated movements. Sometimes there's segregation, but a lot of times there's also overlap. So it's like, walleye or walleye or walleye when it comes to these great lakes right so it, okay. it's kind of it's it's kind of it's kind of neat and that also allows us to have lessons learned you know as so you don't have to always repeat all the same research you kind of get an idea of like, okay hey these things behave fairly similarly we can take these lessons here and apply them in other areas yeah i, I would be really interested in the lake michigan stuff because i've actually spent quite a bit of time on big bay little bay to knock mm -hmm. um and even down sturgeon bay like washington island Acanto, um even farther into green bay and, and those fish move a lot like if you go yeah. there all of a sudden they just seem to disappear mainly because of water temperature because water yeah. temperature can swing like 20 degrees by the wind changing direction um i mean so, it's crazy so i'm not gonna yeah, so I'm not going to be the authority on that because, again, I'm just the director and I, you know, they give me a few hand notes, you know, on, on this. Right. And uh, so, but what, you know, some of the things they were telling me is like, so for the big bait, you know, the, the Dinox populations, like, yep, they go up there, they're spawn, but then they start moving south pretty rapidly after the spawning period. And so there's like a lot of them that congregate there in the middle of Green Bay, and then even some decent proportion of them migrate down south to southern Green Bay. And so... It's kind of the opposite you see in Lake Erie in the Western Basin, right? Like, what what do walleye do in the Western Basin? Do they s stick around Lake Erie during? I mean, during the Western in the Western Basin all summer long? No, they kind of get out, don't just they? Just a little, just the little fellows. Yeah, just the little fellows, but the bigger ones move their way out. Well, it seems like from what, some of the research they were sharing with me is that you know a lot of those big bay, Dino little bay, Dinock and big big bay, Dinock walleye actually start moving down south. That probably corresponds with larger forage base down there. And when when you say down south, for some of the guys listening to this that maybe know Green Bay well, do you have any like general location areas of what that means? All right, get your pencils out, and I'll give you no. So generally, the the Chambers Island area, right? So that's kind of like the mid bay, and then down south towards you know into near Green Bay, down to the, at the southern end. So interestingly, uh, let me dig up the number here that he they given me. Uh, they talked about the number of fish that migrate out of, okay, 
So 36% of the uh, fish that were tagged up there, there in the big and little bays, the knock, moved out into Lake Michigan. So here you have like, all, all like open Lake Michigan. Yes, sir. All right. And then yeah, I was just as surprised. I was like, that's a third. Right. And so why would a walleye be moving out into lake trout water or salmon water? Right. So e even within there, do you have any detailed stuff? Of, I mean, again, I'm not asking for coordinates, of course, but I mean, is this like, are we talking like outer Traverse City, like that type yeah. of deal? So we don't have good receiver coverage through the main lake uh, of M Lake Michigan. So um, Green Bay, if you go to GLaDOS, our GLaDOS webpage, just type in G-L-A-T-O-S, and there's a map there of all the acoustic receivers. So Green Bay is pepper, just like Lake Erie is, just like Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. The open waters of Lake Michigan are not really well um, covered with receivers just because there's not as many research questions and you know it takes quite a bit of expense to operate vessels off there but then there's a bunch of receivers over in traverse uh you know near traverse bay traverse city and i think it's bear island or yeah is it sleeping bear island or whatever up there up there by the dunes but it, it so i don't know how far across they go and what percentage of them the but 36 percent migrate out of green bay proper into so the open of, water. of that 30 some percent did you ping anything on the places that you did have receivers I, that i did not i don't have any follow-up on that so you know working with the, the the dnr biologists there um they would be able to you know maybe help anglers out a little bit more um but i don't know how far over they were detected just for for full disclosure as of right now I mean, is it, is it fair to say that some of these other bodies of water, I mean, like Lake Superior, I don't know the numbers, but I can tell you that there's way less angler hours there yeah. than there is, you know, where, where we're talking. Is this something that's probably going to get built up or is it just too much expense to really, if we talk about this in three years? So it goes back to the research questions, right? So like five years ago, there were some re research questions on Lake Huron, but there weren't the research questions that warranted a lake-wide array like we had in Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Well, last year we finished wiring off Lake Ontario, uh, Lake uh, Huron. So all of Lake Huron is wired. So if a fish moves out, we're going to know it. So it's all basically based on whatever the, the research questions are. And if you take a step back and you look at like where the biggest fishery issues are in the Great Lakes, well, Lake Huron, there's a very important commercial and recreational fisheries. Lake Michigan, it's mostly salmon, and it's, but it's mostly kind of directed around the ports, right? Around the mouths of the ports and whatnot in Traverse uh, Bay, um, maybe up in the North Channel and Green Bay for, for, for certain. Like Lake Erie, you, everybody fishes all of Lake Erie, right? Like there's probably not a, a corner of Lake Erie that hasn't been run over by a recreational boat or a commercial fishing boat. So it's really kind of, a lot of this research is driven by what the management questions are. And so that's why in the center, center of Lake Michigan right now, we don't have any receivers there. But yeah, I think moving forward, if, you know, we start talking about like, forage if we're able to you know tag these forage species like well how does the forage move in lake michigan well we got to have receivers then you know across across the lake or how do salmon move across the lake because we know salmon are capable of very long distance migrations well i mean so where are we at with like lake huron i know we touched a little bit of that i think yeah. on the first one but uh, i mean those fish move like crazy yeah. up there too like from saginaw bay to the charities but i think guys are learning now from like charities to like rogers city to almost the saint mary's river system so 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 i don't know if you guys have the capability of like pulling up a map of the glados uh network or if your producer wants to put a link into it um but if you you pull it up all of lake huron is wired so like Saginaw, uh, sorry, Saginaw Bay is wired with a pretty dense array. And then once you move out into Lake Huron, the spacing is a little bit more sparse and sporadic. But yep, the whole the whole lake is covered as well as the Canadian waters as well. Like so the whole freaking lake is covered with receivers. And so now we'll be able to really build on the study that we did originally in 2011. We didn't have many receivers in Lake Huron, we had like some little finger lines going up along the shoreline in Lake Huron on the on the U.S. side. But now we have the broader array. And so now we'll really be able to start answering some of those questions. And uh, but, yeah, that's that's where we are. So when you say like kind of peppering that out there or full coverage, 
I don't remember how far apart can those be. Like, I mean, is it like a quarter mile that you need one? Yeah. Or is it... so, so maybe again, I, I'm not fast in my fingers here, but so like in the open water, we have them every 15 kilometers. And so I think that relates somewhere down to every seven and a half miles or it's the other way around. Yeah. I think it's about every seven and a half miles, but in the Western basin, we have them like every four kilometers or every eight kilometers apart. So they're much more dense in the, like the Western basin in Saginaw Bay and as well as in Green Bay. Interesting. See, I, I thought they'd have to be even closer together, but I guess technology is what it is. huh? Well, I guess you, you got to keep in mind is we're not trying to keep in constant contact with these fish. We're okay. Not seeing a fish for, a couple weeks at a time, right? As long as that fish is moving around and we see them periodically, that's really what we want. We're kind of just basically tra tracking their general movements and their general status. It's not until we're like looking at like fine scale habitat use. Like we had talked a little bit about bit about the dynamics of between the bar and the bedroom, uh, you know, last time about <laughs> spawning activity. I knew you'd giggle when I said that, you know, so we talked about the spawning activity, you know, that's when we use a fine scale positioning system where it tells us literally within like a meter or two of accuracy of where that fish is so we get a lat and a long of not where the receiver is when we're working with a small cluster of receivers but exactly where that fish is with some known error so like like left field question um you know we're we're into teeth okay things with teeth here that's that's yeah. kind of our our customer yeah. and my my deal but mm -hmm. i i still like the smallmouth bass so yeah Green pickles or ditch pickles or whatever you want to call them aside, uh, green carp, whatever, uh, smallmouth bass. Do they, yeah. do they do they fit into this and are they – is that – because I know you have something going with that, right? Yeah. But is that, is that going to proceed to be greater? Because, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are into that too. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. It's only, I don't know. It's Is it like the evolution of fishermen? Like they kind of start off with one species and then they kind of just get more refined and they get like more like – geeked out and they're like it seems seems like those smallmouth guys are like that's it like yeah i'll go catch some walleye if i got nothing better to do but i'm really chasing the smallmouth and like i've got a guy that's basically the way he talks yeah the smallmouth is kind of a, a a new frontier and i think you i don't know if you've seen on maybe on some of your social media feeds recently uh two biologists from the uh, ohio department of natural resources there in the sandusky fisheries research station published a paper on smallmouth bass movements with the telemetry stuff and uh oh. yeah I mean, check Facebook, Zach Slagle and Matt Faust. And so basically they had some one fish that left Sandusky Bay, went all the way over to the Michigan shoreline, then ended up somewhere like near uh, Illyria or Lorraine, right? So these things are making, that thing was making serious migrations. And so this is really the first time where we're able to start quantifying, you know, how far these things really actually do move because the perception has always been, oh, smallmouth are homebodies. They have a small home area or core area, but I think what we're learning is that, no, it's probably much broader than what you really think it is. And so, again, you had that world record or that state record, certainly, smallmouth bass. I think somebody said it's the third largest smallmouth ever caught. Is that correct? Correct. I'm going to give you a little shameless plug. That was actually one of my best friends, and he's been on the Big Water Posse for 20 years. Okay. And, um, yeah, that was the third largest one um taken largest one on the great lakes or basically north of the mason dixon line um so i mean it was a freak and you know ironically with that i'm not going to give too much away because those guys have asked me to keep the particulars of that exactly you know quiet but that fish was a roamer okay that was not a fish that was like sitting on a rock eating gobies or waiting yeah. for something to kind of come by like and and these guys have figured out that almost like walleye fishing that some of the biggest smallmouth you know travel and basically chase a different forage base and so that's about all i can say without getting in trouble with those guys um, but i found the same thing too because i have caught some of the biggest smallmouth of my life trolling for walleyes like um, west of um between dunkirk and buffalo new york yep. mm -hmm. 60 70 feet of water or more suspended uh, and there was a Bassmasters event there years ago that those guys were drop shotting like 40, 50 feet down and 60, 70, 80 feet or whatever it was, right? But suspended in these yep. bass, that's they were chasing a different food, almost like they were walleyes. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it from an a, from a energetic standpoint, right, they could get on maybe some of these big clouds of bait fish, whether they be emerald shiners or gizzard shad or rainbow smelt as you're you know down there 
in Dunkirk, you know, like that's totally atypical. And and once in a while, we would just get this freaking Bronco smallmouth in a, one of our gillnet surveys, right? That were set suspended below the surface for walleye. And we're like, yep, this guy's out here living large. He's just keying in on the open war, water forage like the other big predators are. So, yeah. So they, a lot of these fish have different tactics, right? They, you know, okay, I'm a, a great, uh, you know, some cohort of the population may just be eating crayfish or gobies in the rocks. Some may just say, nope, I'm going offshore and I'm going to go just chase clouds of bait fish. And there's an advantage for me to do that, even though energetically it's very expensive for me. The payoff is big. Right. So is there any other numbers with that smallmouth stuff that you kind of – can remember or? i i can't all i can say is that and, and again matt faust and zach schlegel i think zach is the uh the lead on that project um they certainly th they would be your best resource for that uh but it actually has spawned if you would forgive the pun um, oh my that was that was shameless that shameless was, yeah, yeah that was like a dad <laughs> joke right like yeah that was total yeah. dad joke like I, you need to wear new balances if you're gonna yeah, say that. yeah, yeah. No. who says i'm not wearing them actually <laughs> I, I i refuse to give up the crocs Mostly Are because you, my, my kids hate them so much. Yeah, I figured you were like in sweatpants right now. No, 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 no. Carhartts. Come on now. Give me a little bit. Carhartt work pants. Got it. Um, All right. So I, across the Great Lakes, there's become a, the, the interest in smallmouth bass fishing and population has just been blossoming. Just like with the advent of tournaments, you know, it used to be that smallmouth were eaten on Lake Erie, right? You'd see like just big coolers of these things being smoked you know like in terms of people and unfortunately it. guys are still doing it but. yeah yeah but the incidence of it is a probably a pittance relative to what it once was right it well, it's a, yeah, to me it's a different angler chasing it like i'm, I'm a firm believer that smallmouth would be as big probably as walleye here if you could fish for them easier meaning most of the guys in bass boats or the type of boats that they have when they come here you just get the tar beat out of you or the distances you have to go you know what i mean they're like they're not on the south shore all the time like where they're located like you're gonna take a beating so man the, the best day of the year was when a, a small uh, a bass tournament came to town in sandusky bay and you had a bunch of these guys from the south coming up to fish it. We would all just sit along the break wall, and if it was really snotty, we just watched them, you know, come out of the launch, you know, hammer down and just like just getting pummeled. It was like, yeah, that's not going to work out well for them in about two miles. Yeah, chiropractic uh, <laughs> tent setup right here. Oof. Yeah. So anyway, across the Great Lakes, uh, smallmouth bass research. Like, so there's a, a large project that's going to be taking place next year with smallmouth, and it actually has uh, also um, some components or it's kind of part of a larger project that's starting out of green bay uh with smallmouth bass and then i think there's some also going on in lake ontario so like the smallmouth bass thing is like really picking up steam in the great lakes looking at things like well what happens to you to these fish if you displace them like during a tournament and i think that's kind of what the zach and uh matt faust paper were is like like okay these fish were caught in a tournament what did they do after they were released that did would be really back? That would be really inter interesting information because we can't get that with the walleyes because they're uh, it's a kill tournament basically. Yeah. yeah. So that but that would be that would be really interesting. So there's all because there's a lot more implications for genetics like population genetics and stuff like that if you start moving around all you know because some of these guys have no problem running 40 50 miles and yeah right and for yeah, uh, easy yeah easy with today's boat so that's the next frontier or I guess that's the next biggest you know in terms of sport fish research and telemetry is work, you know, questions around, uh, smallmouth bass, uh, the smallmouth bass fishery in the great lakes. So Chris, you know, when we were kind of preparing for this, you talked about, you know, the mixed stock thing, and I don't even know what that really means. So I, and, but I know you were excited about it. So, so help me on what exactly that means for us and, and what are the numbers here? Right. So the mixed stock kind of goes back to that, like the diverse portfolio I'd mentioned earlier, or like, you know, the fact that I was talking about in green Bay where like you have all these individual stocks that spawn, but then they come and meet up like one place in the lake. Right. So I talked about the, the big and little bay Dinoc fish moving south and then the southern tributary fish kind of moving more north and so like they're kind of collabor uh you know congealing or kind of like mixing there around the chambers island um area so like for a mixed stock what a fishery manager really wants to know is like hey which of these stocks is the most important to my fishery right and so a lot of times this is very difficult to parse out uh, especially like with genetics because 
a lot of these stocks haven't been separated long enough for us to differentiate people uh, to di differentiate the stocks on a genetic basis, right? Like we have really good genetic stocks that like in a murder mystery, we can say, this is the person who did it if they left some kind of DNA around, but actually going back to a higher level, it's somewhat harder to say, okay, these were from the Western basin, you know, from the Toussaint reef and Niagara reef area compared to the Maumee river. Right. Because even if you have a couple individuals going back and forth there, the genetics get polluted and you might be able to differentiate those fish from an eastern basin stock. But you can't differentiate, say, a reef fish from a, a uh, Maumee River fish. So one of the ways of getting at this is like, OK, well, what if we were able to tag these fish and then watch where they go to spawn? So if we can't do it genetically what if we tag them and then behaviorally we got an idea of which fish were the most important so that's exactly what we've been doing so on lake erie uh matt faust has been leading a project where they go out during like may and june and july like when the peak of our fishery is occurring in the western basin like so the trophy hunters may fish the western basin early in the year but again as the year goes on they start sliding east right ross like they don't they're not gonna, yeah so the, the amount of effort in the central basin in like June and July is, while it's impressive, it's not as high as it is in the Western basin because in the Western basin, there's a lot more fish and they're easy to catch. So what, what the DNR is doing, uh, not only on Lake Erie, but there's thoughts of doing this elsewhere, um, is they go out there and mimic how that fishery is operating. So literally those researchers went out on a commercial fishing boat I mean, on a charter boat, and they went out with a, someone like you who trolls, you know, so you want to get casters and trollers, caught fish, put transmitters in them, and then we wa they watch where they go back to spawn in successive years. So the question here is, okay, which one of these stocks is the most important for the Western Basin fishery during the summer? So then we look at their movement patterns the following spring. Well, do they go to the reefs? Do they go to the Detroit River? Do they go to the Maumee River? And then how repeatable is that? So it's actually answering the question from, you know, from a backwards methodology in some respects. And so have we been doing that long enough to have a feel at least where this may be going? Yeah. So I believe uh, some of the numbers I'd gotten, like, so since 2018, they've released close to 600 fish, like, mimicking this method so in 18 19 and 20 i believe they did and there was i think there was one year where there was a hiccup there with the COVID stuff but yeah it's getting to the point now where we're starting to get the returns back when they can start you know making some inferences in you know which stocks are the most important you know just real early you know some real early data and this may change as more results come in but you know it really looks like from some of the earliest tags that we released a lot those western basin reefs like the Toussaint, the Niagara, the Cone, that what we call the, the Western Basin Reef Complex, really important for the uh, for the the Ohio recreational fishery in, in you know during the summer. Yeah, I can remember, and again, these are not factual things like you, but you know, the netting up in Canada, like changing where those fish were at around the hens, the chicks, mm -hmm. you know, that stuff yeah. like up there. And that people, you know, saying, hey, just some of my Canadian buddies, like, hey, you just can't catch fish up there like you used to. And rather those fish just said, we're not going to do that there anymore because they sensed the danger or they all got caught up in a gill net. Um, but then some of those other numbers, um, you know, through Travis's office earlier, back when Jeff was still there, it was like, hey, Sandusky Bay has bigger fish that tend to spawn earlier and they tend to bug out, you know, boogie out first. Mm -hmm. And and those are some of the bigger fish. So when you say important, you know, like with the, the Camp Perry Reef Complex, you know, that you mm -hmm. just mentioned, is that because of numbers or because of size or both? Or I think important, like, so as a fishery manager, they're like, well, important meaning what stocks support this fishery, right? Like, so if something were to happen to the Maumee River, like just say hypothetically went dry and, and fish weren't spawning in there anymore. How big of a hit would that be to the walleye population or the walleye fishery in the Western Basin? So that's what I mean in terms of importance, right? So if they propose some type of activity on the Western Basin reefs, you know, whatever it is, like say they wanted to put a an airfield there just hypothetically. Well, what kind of impact would that have on the fishery? Well, when it comes to the walleye fishery, it could have like, it would likely have a really, really big impact on the fishery. So that's when I say importance, that's what I mean. So the other importance I talked about was like to the Eastern Basin stocks, right? The Eastern Basin fisheries, like down in Dunkirk, New York, 
Those fisheries during the summer are highly dependent on Western Basin migrants. So if the Western Basin stock is declining, those fisheries are going to suffer. Yeah, because there, there's no fish there until at least June, pretty much. Yeah, right? I mean, so, so, that's, so what's been interesting and what's been on the rise since I've been working on Lake Erie is actually the, the prevalence and the predominance of Eastern Basin stocks. Like, so there has been a rise in recruitment in like the Van Buren area off there, off of Dunkirk, the Cataraugus Creek, and then up in Ontario, the Grand River. So like, it's been interesting. It, it's like you've, they've been seeing more and more uh, recruitment up there, recruitment events that are Eastern Basin stock fish. However, behaviorally, they're a lot different than the Western Basin fish because behaviorally, those Eastern Basin stocks generally never leave the Eastern Basin and they're more shore oriented. Whereas the Western Basin stocks, man, I could show you those anim animations if you go on YouTube and you look at the animations. Those Western Basin fish are out in the middle of the Eastern Basin. So they're actually supporting a different fishery than those Eastern Basin stocks. Well, you know, like in Buffalo, it's kind of a tough fishery and they seem to be like ghosts, but I have a lot of friends that are down that way and fish for walleyes. And it's a lot of people don't realize because like if you live where I live or where you're at, people think of East as like, it's always deeper. And when you get down to Buffalo, if you want to look on a map, that's not the case. It's almost like it's the Western Basin again, kind of. Yeah. And so, but that fishery, they just don't seem to have, and it seems like there's more than there used to be, but to mm -hmm. your point, it's not like the Western Basin. There's a handful of fish there and maybe it's the habitat or whatever, but from what I'm hearing from you is it's, it's probably creeping up more and more than what it was for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Eastern Basin, like, so the local fishery, like, you know, so if they were fishing, say, in May and June before those Western Basin fish, you know, started getting down there, it's a near shore fishery. Like that's where they're not far offshore. They start going off more shore, offshore more as the summer progresses and the, those Western Basin migrants show up. But interestingly, the size grade, and I don't know if you would find this, you know, accurate or not, or the people you fish, they're some of the biggest walleye that you'll find in Lake Erie are offshore in the Eastern Basin at that time of year. For sure. I, I think a lot of the biggest fish, once you get past April, probably don't see a lot of uh, hook, line, and sinkers, if you will. Yeah. They're, they're, so functionally, they're going to a reserve. They're going into an area that's no Which, fishing. To me, it's the exact same thing on Lake Michigan because I've spent so much time over there and fishing. And like when you say big bait and knock, little bait and knock, when you get out towards the mouth of those, or I can tell you right now, I've without getting too detailed, I have a lot of friends and maybe myself who's won a decent amount of money, you know, fishing around chambers and green and that open water stuff way back in the day. And that was where guys just didn't think that they went. And I think that there's a lot more, you know, guys that I know that definitely aren't talking about it that are fishing those open waters of Lake Michigan and catching giant walleye. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. is, is it's so inconsistent. So yep. whether it's a charter guy like me or even a tournament guy, it's like here today, gone in an hour, not tomorrow. It's a gamble. And, so, and when you just have a bigger swimming pool to try to find that nickel in. And yep. I think that that's why those things, like you said, it's almost like an estuary because they just, yeah. You, you can't stay on them and there's not enough of them. You know, that, that number, while there's still a ton of fish in Lake Erie, I think what people forget is it's like, if you throw a million pennies out there, even though there's a million, it's still hard to find them in a body of water like Lake Erie. Yeah. And, 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 and particularly when they start going offshore and they start suspending, right? So like to your point in Lake Michigan, like, okay, are they going offshore? Or are they hugging the shoreline? You know, I would say they're probably finding whatever pods of forage fish, whether it be, the alewives or whatever, and they're just keying in on those. Well, they're not behaving like walleye. And some of the, the information that you gave us, you know, on the last podcast was that these fish are, are deep, generally speaking. And, mm -hmm. and walleye guys with a lot of their tackle or their predominant tactics that they're going to use, it's pretty tough to get a lure in front of them, even if you know they're there. Um, you know, it's just much more difficult, especially to run multiple lines that deep. Yeah, and it, it goes back to what we call as catchability, right? Like, so you could you could look on your 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 sonar, right, and you probably could see a bunch of walleye stacked up on the bottom, but you cannot get them to go to save your life. There may be you may see a blip or two up high in the water column, and you're like, but I can catch those because they're up there, they're in that positive new mood. That fish actually has a higher catchability than the one down on the bottom, right? And so it goes back to the catchability of the fish. So I, I've got a question for you, and I already know before I ask it, I want—I don't want scientist, doctor, okay, 
Chris, what, what I'm going to ask you is a, probably an educated opinion because I, I know you're not going to have an exact one, two, three mm-hmm. answer on this. But last winter, since the last time we did this podcast, uh, I spent a, a good portion of the winter on, on South Bass Island and we were ice fishing. Mm-hmm. And we, for the most part, we had a couple little waves come through. Okay. And again, you know, people that can't visualize this, there's basically a couple bowling alleys where you can come through the, the fish that they have to come through the Bass Islands. And, and we're kind of, we're staged up and, you know, we, we know where those movements are at. And, and we caught some fish good early, but then it seemed like we were dealing with resident fish based on size and just the way that they were pocketed in here than they're not getting those floods of fish coming through. And it made for a much tougher season. And especially then all of a sudden it was like the dinks came in and, you know, the sublegal fish, the really small to, I mean, you know, seven, eight inches to then, uh, of course, that 13, 14, maybe not quite 15 inch deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that, that second half of that ice season, I'm like, normally it gets better there because those fish are, they're getting to that spot of, hey, we're staging. Because um, in many cases, when we don't have ice, they're almost getting ready to do their thing. So that long winded kind of build up leads to this. So it's like, man, they just didn't get here. It was a much tougher season than what we normally see, in my opinion. And I think everybody's there. So in this, we had the same thing in the boats, though. So here we are fishing, you know, let's say almost April, if it wasn't, or late March. Like part of it comes into play with water clarity and where you can go mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. like that. But I'm not going to say exactly, but all I'm going to tell you is I fished really, really, really far east for where I ever would. And these fish, you know, again, I'm not a fisheries guy like you, right? I don't have a degree in this, but I can tell when you got females and they're still full eggs. And these were pre-spawn fish in a time where they, I think they almost would have normally spawned by a calendar, Mm -hmm. but they were way, way, way. And there was a large population of them, you know, and that's why I'm not going to say the exact ports, but there, because there's nobody really fishing them. And a couple of us got onto this and you go, wait a minute. And then all of a sudden you could almost follow Chris. You could see these fish moving back because then when, when I'm fishing them, I'm moving the next day I go they're three, four miles this way. Yeah. And they were, they were moving, I would say three to five miles West a day. What do you, what, what do you make of that? Oh, so they were moving three to five miles West a day or back East? No, no. These were pre-spawn fish in, yeah. in, in early April. Yeah. They definitely had eggs in them. They were hard. And they, that school of fish, there were several schools of them. And there was even pods where we would find them. But they were 100% moving back west. I firmly believe that those fish were going to spawn somewhere in the western basin um, because they were offshore. These were not Mm -hmm. close to shore fish. And, I mean, they were some of the biggest fish in the system. And these fish were 8 to 12 pounds. Yeah. So, I mean, so, again, we we do very little with the what we call the winter ecology of fish. And that's probably not the best thing but we just it's it, you have other management questions you're asking but when if i take a look at the, again at those animations i told you about the little blue dots marching across the screen that i think you've seen before there's we've certainly seen some see some uh, annual variability and so that's actually a question we can test now very very easily we can look at it like okay of those females that we we tagged did they all move back at the same time every year and i'm going to say the answer is probably no and i think it goes back to what you're saying it's it, it depends upon probably at that time of year water clarity water turbidity because think about it at that time of year those females are doing the opposite they're probably looking for the warmest water they can find and so it may be that the water was a bit warmer out there so that those gametes can develop to get ready to spawn because the shallow water is way more susceptible to the fluctuations in temperature than the deeper water it retains its quote unquote heat more right so Mm -hmm. it could be a function of that could be water clarity but yeah i mean what you're saying doesn't surprise me because again remember in the past guys very rarely fished in the spring like that right like I remember people telling me, oh, yeah, uh, Labor Day was like, right, April 30th was like the unofficial start to walleye yeah. season. There'd be a handful of guys earlier, but. I'm, so. I'm with you, but, man, I, you know, I got 20 years of doing it pretty much every day in the springtime, and I've never seen anything yeah. like that where it was like, it wasn't just like some of the fish. I mean, it was like a really good portion of the population was not down because the guys were struggling. I mean, there was it was to the point where guys were moving their their charter boats, mm-hmm. you know, to other ports because. Like, hey, there's just there's nothing here to be caught. Um, you so, know, and it's just... so while I have the ability to really vary when they spawn, like they're not as as restricted to when they're going to spawn as some other species are, right? So they have what we call a lot more plasticity. So, like on the reefs, right? 
if it's a year where we have a lot of ice and the reefs are covered with ice, the spawn may be later in the spring than if it's if we've had no ice, right? You might start seeing a fish spawning in on the reefs in you know late March, right? Right. In some years, and then in other years, you may not start seeing them till the middle of April or maybe even a little bit later, depending upon if there's ice. So they have that ability to to vary it you know, a little bit like, so some other species like whitefish, they're kind of cool. Like they're, it's almost like, I won't say it's a calendar day, but I know Thanksgiving is when those darn things want to spawn regardless of what the weather temperature has been. So it may be like, they're more, a little bit more driven by photo period than say walleye that may be a little bit more, have a little bit more flexibility and have water temperatures right. be more of a guide. And, and to me, it was just weird because again, obviously it's my business, right? But I've seen that where I 100% agree, and I've seen we've had years where I don't remember, it was maybe 2012 or something like that, where it was like 75 or 80 degrees for several yeah. days in February, if you remember. Yeah. I remember. And no, we, I remember. And we were out there almost literally in a t-shirt, and it was just crazy, and the, the fishing was all giant fish, and it was, they were basically, they were moving up, man. They kind of like were triggering early. So 100% these little oddball things, but to see such a big population, it was weird to me because... The spring has always been maybe you're sliding that calendar back and forth a little bit, but nothing like flipping a page, if you know what I mean, yeah, where yeah. in the fall, I they see even looking at like with Travis Hartman in one of his little slideshows that he does from like he's got like five or six years showing the, the dots, as you say, you know, it's your information. A lot of it that telemetry is showing here's where the mass of this grouping is in, you know, the fall of, you know, and then he's got the little movement deal. Really cool presentation to see. But in the fall, it's like we almost expect like, hey, they're east of Kelly's. And then the next year, like, nope, they're down in Vermilion or Lorraine or, hey, the, the Cleveland group just, man, they're not even there at all. Like, and then some, you know, falls that those fish in Cleveland don't, you know, they slide back a little bit. Um, but fall has always been erratic to me. And, and again, I don't know if there's any info you have as far as factors of that, or it, I know it'll be a little bit of a guess, but. Well, I mean, so the telemetry is the right, right tool to answer that question. I just don't know if we had enough tagged fish out to answer that question, like for what you're saying for last year, right? Because like, so again, I tagged most of my fish in 2011 and 2000, I think it was what, 15. So those those tags have winked out because they're only four-year tags. Matt, uh, it was with the mixed fishery stuff, his are three-year tags. He's been doing it fairly recently. The problem is, is because he's... Uh, uh, tagging those fish during the non-spawning period, it's very difficult to tell if a fish is a male or a female at that time of year. So he can't say, oh, these are the females, these are the males, right? right. But So there may be some data there that we can start you know, gleaning, but that's another... It, telemetry would be, actually be the perfect tool to address that question and whether or not it varies annually and how much. Like, and so they did this with cod, like in the in the in the Atlantic, like, and they they were able to show that, hey, yeah, in years of a bad hatch, these fish held off or were out in the ocean for a longer period of time and didn't come close to shore because some behavioral uh, thing that was going on out in the lake. Well, and I think that's why we kind of circled back with you is, is the best part of this whole thing, in my opinion, is that it's not opinion. Like the information yeah. and, the, and the numbers are going to get better and better. And these fish, generally speaking, are going to hopefully live long enough that you're going to keep the trackers in them. Yeah. Um, and they know that we keep getting more and more. So every time we touch base. So I guess kind of one of the other questions would be is, you know, from what we have talked about last time, like that was crazy good information. Not that this isn't, but what has really changed to been the most monumentous, like just the, the biggest change from last time we spoke that you've learned? With respect with walleye or just in fisheries in general? With, you know, any, any of the info that you have that you feel that is as concrete as can be. Well, so I, I think uh, the, the, the stock contribution, and although we only have preliminary numbers and I don't want to, you know, start releasing those on a podcast, right? Because for uh, obvious reasons, that's a management <laughs> thing, you know, and I still want to, you know, have things thrown at me when I, you know, walk into the office over there. The mixed stock thing, in my opinion, is going to revolutionize or at least really provide the managers with information that they've never had before, right? Because now they can start putting hard numbers on these different fisheries. So we did the same exact mixed fishery thing up in Canada. Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources took their boat out, fished the 
uh, gill nets just like the commercial fishers would do using the same type of gear. We tagged fish up there and we're going to see where those fish go as well. So from a lake wide perspective, this to me, I think is going to be huge. And then doing this and repeating this across the Great Lakes is going to be huge. But I think the biggest thing, and I don't know how how appealing this is going to be to your to your listeners, because like you say, you're, it's mostly like a, a trolling, uh, trolling, big water, toothy crowd is the work we're going to start doing with yellow perch so we've always had trouble you'd be surprised even at the last sports show we were at a lot of those guys are that's the same people okay. and, and if nothing else it's the food yeah so so this is kind of like the plug for that right so we've always had trouble catching yellow perch because they tend to be deep and then when you bring them up they're like not in good condition right i'm sure you've been always been there perch jerking right and they start barfing their food up their swim bladder comes through yeah you kind of feel bad like he's too small to keep but yeah like ooh, yeah. this yeah, might be seagull time yeah yeah so we're, we're, we've been trying to work out those kinks because they're harder to tag but we, we're starting to make some progress and so we're actually releasing yellow perch we started this we did some preliminary work off of uh huron one fall and then we uh repeated the study uh this past fall where we re released yellow perch into the Western Basin. But the cool thing about these yellow perch is that even though their tags are small, they have this digestion tag on them. So like if they're eaten, they start pinging a different code, right? So now- Whoa, whoa, how do you do that? <laughs> so you've watched uh, Christmas Vacation, right? And Clark was, you know, he had the, the substance oh, this that is, he- This is gonna be good. We got Clark Griswold in the explanation. This is, this is <laughs> Clark Griswold science. So anyway, it basically, there's a polymer in that tag that when a fish it eats this fish that's been tagged, the polymer disintegrates. It creates a new electric uh, signal to be given off, and it changes the signal of that tag. So I then know how long ago that fish was eaten. And then you can estimate predation rates. So those same juvenile Cisco, like literally the Cisco, few inches big. Up in Saginaw Bay, we tag them with these digestion tags, put them out in the lake, and then watch their fate as they were released out into uh, the wild. And so we're doing the same thing with yellow perch here on Lake Erie. Hey, Chris, are there any uh, updates with the with the Asian carp um, in this in the Great Lakes system at this point? I, it's, I haven't heard too much about that recently. Yeah, I mean, nothing like groundbreaking. I mean, they continue to monitor the Chicago uh, area waterway. There's a lot of work going on in Sandusky River as well as the Maumee River looking at grass carp because they're, you know, grass carp are what they fall into the, the classification of as an Asian carp. They have a lot different feeding mechanism and mode than like your silvers and your big heads. They're definitely more of a vegetation oriented species, the grass carp. So, but there is a lot of work going on with grass carp and the telemetry has actually been used quite extensively and they're using it to actually, where they'll put the tags in the grass carp. And when they get a hit on these real time receivers, they'll actually scramble a team to go out and try to collect these fish. So it's what they call a Judas fish. It's like, so the fish betrays those he's traveling with to give up the location. <laughs> So no, like, so no lie, like they did this on the Galapagos Islands where someone like released goats and say they would go out there. And I forget if they sh if they would put a collar on a male or a female goat. I think it was the female goat. They put a radio collar on her. Watch where she went. She would go find a bunch of males. They would bring a helicopter in. They'd go in there, wipe out all the males, not shoot her and then let her go find the next pod and kind of do the same thing. Systematic. That's kind of morbid, huh? <laughs> yeah. And they're actually doing the same thing with uh, the snakes. Uh, that was it the the um, in the Everglades. What are they? The Burmese pythons and whatnot. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're doing the same exact thing. They're they're letting they're letting tagged individuals or transmitter individuals go. They betray where the other groups of these things are. They go in there, whack them, and then it goes off to the next pod of things. So we're doing that with they're doing that with grass carp in in Sandusky River. So let's put a uh, one of these tags in Ross. <laughs> right and then wow. it, then they'll off him and then everybody will know where all the fish are right no no that is, the problem is they they let ross live right they, yeah, that, yeah. That, were, were you a producer dude were, i uh, know you want to kill me but were you not paying attention are you still on the clark griswold deal <laughs> so it, yeah it's what they call a judas uh, fish so it's it's a really neat application of telemetry interesting 
that is it's uh it, it just the direction of this i think the future is bright as far as i feel more confident that we're going to do a better job and again it, you know the guys in ohio i think really have a firm grasp on that on and I'm not just saying that, but other because I've seen so many other fisheries be mismanaged so poorly. Uh, so hopefully some of this stuff, again, aside from being cool and helping with us, you know, know where to fish a little bit better, uh, have a better idea of what truly we have in our system. So, I, you know, I won't divulge names, but, you know, periodically I'll have, you know, tournament guys call me and say, hey, what can you tell me about, you know, walleye movements? I'm like, here, here, I hate to deflate you, but you probably have a better sense of what's going on than I do because all of our data has like a year lag to it, right? So like I can tell you that the biggest fish move the furthest east, the earliest, but you know what, Ross, I'm pretty confident you already know that, right? Well, it, you know, it does, but I think here's what, what it's going to happen. This is why I think the future is bright. It's, it's just like me. I've been doing this 20-some years. I have a pretty good idea where things are going to be at. But every now and then, you know, they they do something totally different, whether it's yeah. a weather thing or just fish being fish or whatever, like those two muskies, if someone was shameless plug to go watch your first one, those two muskies that came down and made that big yeah. travels, we'll leave it at that. But uh, when we only have a few years of what you probably would even say is firm information on this, I don't know that as good as it is, and it's 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 eye opening. Yeah, it's not nearly what it's going to be when you have another five to ten years of this same information to eliminate all of the sporadic data and say yeah. and consistently the median data is this. Yeah, and so I mean, like these transmitters, that, at least that we're putting in walleye, I can get them to last as long as ten years if I want to, right? So can you imagine providing that fish actually lives, watching what an individual organism does for ten years? Right. Like, just think about, like, how that would increase our knowledge. I mean, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the value for the managers is that they're putting numbers to these things. What fraction of these fish migrate over here? What fraction of these fish die on an annual basis due to natural causes, just like spawning mortality and just senescence? What fraction died due to fishing? Um, and then how faithful are individual spawners to uh, a, a spot? Like, if you are the Maumee River. Are those fish always going to come back to the Maumee River, or are they pretty promiscuous and just exploring all over the place? That's what we call a spawning site fidelity. Putting numbers to that is really where the value of this telemetry stuff is, because it allows them to quantify it and then build these population model, models that are more accurate moving into the future. So I have, I have got a funny but serious question if you think about this. So... Obviously, the acoustic telemetry, it's acoustic. There are things in the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. But is there any way to know if Willie Walleye 20 inches that was tagged two years ago is in an igloo cooler getting in an F-150 and leaving? Like, is there any way to see, like, how many of those have been caught or, you know, if the data? Well, yeah, works? I mean, so we, we externally tag all these walleye. Like there's a big yellow tube, a big orange tube or something sticking out either their dorsal back out of, the, out of their back or out of their abdomen. And we, re we offer a $100 reward for reporting it, right? So we rely upon anglers if they catch it to report those tags to us. So that, I mean, but there's no like technology. You'd have to go to like a satellite system because that, so an individual walleye would have to have not only acoustic tag, but also an, a satellite tag so that once it gets out of the water, it would get picked up on some type of satellite system. Problem is those tags are too grand to pop. That's pretty expensive. That's pretty expensive. Yeah. Now, I mean, the tags we're using are 350 bucks a pop. And then if we start putting like sensors on them, like a, a predation sensor or a depth sensor or a temperature sensor, that adds more money to the cost. Yeah, because I'm I, I've I've had several fish we've caught, believe it or not, with tracking devices in them, but it was, I believe, prior to the acoustic or not. I mean, yeah, it looked like a CO2 can container, like an old yeah. You know, BB gun. Radio. Too. Probably a radio antenna, unless it was strapped to the back. Well, the only other tagging like this would have been radio tags, and they were either internals or they did some backpack transmitters uh, a few years ago, 2008 or something like that. Yeah. And I've had, I had one that had like an orange tag come out of his dorsal. It was a real skinny, thin, that deal. That was one of ours. Yeah. So yeah. I guess odds wise, I might buy a lottery ticket because 100 million fish getting. I think we're at three tags. I'm pretty good. Yeah, well, I mean, it tally up how many fish you catch over the, the, the course of the year. Yeah, I, and I let the one go. I told, I remember I, I told, I think it was Travis, gave him the info, took a picture of the thing, and I let the yeah. thing go. But 
Yeah. I mean, we encourage anglers to do what they ever they would naturally do, right? So if you were out on a charter and a guy caught this fish and he was out there to fill the freezer, harvest it. That's what you will have done. I want you to behave as normally as you typically would, you know, with these tagged fish. Because that's one of the assumptions of these models is that, you know, you're not modifying the behavior of that fish. Or if an angler were normally to catch it and, and harvest it, then that's what they should do. If they normally would release it, well, then don't go and harvest it. You know, you, you see what I'm saying? It's like, just yep. do what you naturally would have done. We tried to help you out. We threw her back and hopefully it saved a couple bucks and that thing's still providing some more info for us. I appreciate it. Unless it's it died due to hooking mortality and it's just sitting at the bottom of the lake and pinging away. If, well, if he didn't move in probably three months, I think you guys have a pretty good idea what yeah. happened to Timmy, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. There are a lot of that. There's a straight line. Yeah. So is there anything you'd like to leave us in closing that could maybe help us be a better deal with some hard info? Okay. Well, I do feel like I do need to correct one of the erroneous facts I throw on the last podcast. You penny late. Wow. Now, how are we supposed to believe anything you said? I don't producer. I don't believe anything now. Here's my, my shtick for science, right? It's hard enough. Science has taken a hard enough hit over the last few years. I I figure, you know, uh, truth in advertising is important, right? So, Point being, as I had said that, you know, while I experienced 50 degrees temperature swings and it knocked you out of your chair, you're like, no way. And I was like, I got thinking about this morning. I was listening to, I was like, yep, I understand why he, he, he balked at that. And, and what it was is I was thinking that while I, uh, we didn't realize that they would inhabit water that's 10 degrees Celsius, which corresponds to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So I think that's where my mind got a little bit slipped up. However, Using those thermal sensor tags that I talked about last time, we have seen large temperature shifts, you know, from down the 10 Celsius degree all the way up to the mid to upper 20s, which corresponds to about a 30 degree shift in temperature that we would observe over a 20, 24 hour period. And so you would see those temperatures, of course, in the Eastern Basin. You wouldn't see them anywhere in the Western Basin or probably anywhere in the Central Basin, really. It's not till they get into the Eastern Basin where they're in the up up high in the water column where it's warm, but then they get down there where, you know, you would find typically lake trout. So true, just, you know, just to stick true to form, uh, I, I did feel like it was somewhat important to correct that because that is quite outlandish on my part. There we go. Producer, now we know. We know again. I, I'll trust them now again. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, Ross. I, I appreciate you, you, you giving us a platform to talk about this stuff. Like I said, it's so hard, you know, to get this stuff out to angler groups, right? I mean, and, you know, it's just because you got to write the final reports. You got to secure funding for the next year. Like, it's just, this is kind of this vicious cycle. So anytime we have an outlet like this where we can kind of talk to a bunch of people simultaneously, like, that's that's our best shot. I'm glad to hear, I think you had said that, at the boat show, Cleveland boat show this weekend, you know, that some of the results were being discussed. And I know other researchers are trying to do this throughout, you know, the, uh, throughout the basin. And I appreciate you, uh, when you were on that DOS boat, uh, episode where you brought him over to the Sandusky office and you talked a little bit about the telemetry stuff while you were kitty cat fishing in, uh, Sandusky Bay. I was like, oh yeah, I must've been blown that day. I mean, kudos to you because that's what we're really looking for is folks who have a voice with a larger media outlet to kind of let people know what we're doing. Like I said, a lot of this is fish and wildlife dollars, excise tax. And, you know, don't you want to see your taxes are being used, you know, for, you know, for doing good research. And that's the, the point of it. Well, I'll tell you what, do your, uh, do your homework there, figure out some stuff. And um, a year from now, we're going to circle back and see what else we can learn. All right. That Fair sounds enough. good to me. Chris, thanks for taking the time and doing that little research for us and everything you should do on a daily basis to help the fishery in an indirect and really direct way. Thank you for joining the Big Water Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Until the next episode, we are out.